Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the MIT Faculty Forum. Uh, my name is Aviva Rutkin, uh, and I'm going to be serving as today's moderator. Uh, I'm a master's in 2013 uh, in science writing, and today I'm the math and data editor at the Conversation US uh, nonprofit news publication. Um, before we get started, just a reminder, um, we welcome all your questions during this chat. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, if you want to send them in, um, alumni who are joining us via Zoom um, can use the Q&A feature on the toolbar. Um, and those on YouTube um, can add your, comment, your questions to the comments field right next to the stream. Um, you can also tweet. We encourage you to tweet um, using the hashtag MITBetterWorld. Uh, today, we're hosting Melissa Masmanian, a 2009 graduate in the PhD program in management at MIT. Uh, Melissa is an associate professor in informatics in the School of Information and Computer Science, as well as an associate professor in organization and management in the Paul Merritt School of Management at the University of California, Irvine. Um, Melissa researches our emerging relationships to wireless modes of communication and the social dynamics that these devices have shaped. Uh, her recent publications and presentation also cover topics ranging from parenting in the digital age to discussions of socioeconomic stigma in online communities. Um, Melissa, thanks for joining us. Um, I'll turn it over to you to share with us some of your, your latest research on these topics. Well, hi everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here today in my office, but with knowing you're all out there, um, I was very pleased to be invited to be part of this forum. Um, I really enjoyed my time and educational experience at MIT, so I'm happy to give back to MIT however I can. But um, a little bit about me. So as Aviva said, I have a long standing interest in the role of communication technologies in both our daily lives and our experiences in the workplace. So I've done a variety of ethnographic research, which just means I go in and actually spend a long time with people and talk to them and get to know them and observe them, hopefully not in a weird way, um, but really engage with their everyday lives to understand how we are experiencing our everyday work practices, our cultural norms and power dynamics, um, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. And the fact that when we have new forms of communication that kind of really allow us to shift our expectations of what is reasonable in terms of how often we're going to be there for each other, be responsive, be, be available, um, how that shifts kind of all our relationships, both personal and professional, and, um, and the effects of that on both organizations and work practices and our experience of everyday life. So that's kind of the big umbrella that I've worked on for um, a dozen years or so. Um, with lots of little side projects along the way. So I'm happy to answer any questions or just continue to talk about my research, um, depending on what comes up. Okay, well, why don't we start with maybe kind of an obvious question, but when you think about the technologies that are changing these norms, the way that we live our lives, what kinds of technologies are you looking at? What are the ones that are kind of the most dramatic um, agents of change? Um, so yeah, there's there's lots. That's a great question. I mean, the most, the one that comes to mind the most is like this one, right? That's sitting right <laughs> Um, So you know, in the last, really in the last 15 years, we went from having zero, um, 15 to 20 years, zero like accessibility outside of our desktop computers um, that were you know situated in a home office or in an office. Um, and then now we go around with these things in our pocket that are these kind of windows to all kinds of you know, digitally mediated kind of information and communication. So there are links to our family, to our friends, to our work colleagues, there are links to the news and the sports scores and et cetera. We all know the multifunctionality of these devices. And so we're carrying around this kind of communication prosthetic, emotional prosthetic and information prosthetic. And we have to, it, it, it changes our experience of everyday life mm -hmm. um, as well as what we can expect of each other. So now, you know, if somebody sends you a text and you don't respond, their immediate assumption is going to be not that, oh, she didn't get my message. It's, oh, she's choosing not to respond to my message for whatever reason. And that's a very different shift in accountability and how people relate to each other in all the micro moments of everyday life. 
So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of a big one. Yeah. <laughs> I've also studied things like electronic medical records, which really shift the dynamics of how work happens and how healthcare happens on a day-to-day basis. Um, I've studied electronic legal files. Similarly, these kind of big work process systems that really affect who knows what, when, who was able to see what information, touch which information, what kind of things become visible or un- invisible in those systems. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had a long conversation yesterday with a new student I'm gonna be working with who's interested in cars. <laughs> And how cars are no longer the machines that we uh, imagine them from from 50 years ago, but they're really just like moving computers um, and, and what that means for our experience of, of the, this kind of vehicle that's going to take us from place A to B so far. Anyway, so lots of different yeah. technologies, but I would say that the smartphone is probably the most dramatic uh, in terms of people's everyday life. And so what kinds of, when you go into, you say you do these studies or you follow people, I mean, what kinds of trade-offs do you see people making to try to handle those expectations? That's a really good question. Um, I think that the very phrasing of that question is kind of fascinating, (laughs) only because I actually don't see people think they're making trade-offs. Right? You're just living. <laughs> and I think that someone who's a little bit of an insider outsider, so I've gotten to know you really well, but I've also spent a lot of your saying this, I potentially frame it more as trade-offs because I think about, you know, where is your attention at any one moment? Um, but very rarely do people think, oh, I'm trading off between being a good parent or being a good colleague. They're trying to do both at once, <laughs> always. And But what it means to be a good parent and a good colleague simultaneously have kind of qualitatively shifted when it, it's perfectly reasonable for your boss to email you at 10 p.m. and ask you to run a forecasting report. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable for the school teacher to text you and say, hey, why didn't so-and-so get their homework in, um, which is not unheard of. And even more formal systems like schools now send parents daily emails. I'm sure probably many of you get this about how your kid is doing, whether or not they you know submitted their assignments, et cetera. So you're just you're just living it, right? Like you're not actually thinking of this as trade-offs very often. And I, I almost, I, I don't, I, it's interesting that people don't see it that way. And actually mm-hmm. in some ways it isn't that way because you're just trying to do both. Let me ask a question. Um, and I'm going to apologize because I think the chances to get this name right are very low, but uh, Egle Recchio asked, how do you show engagement at work while at the same time, at the same time disconnecting? Well, people at work know that you have your phone with you and you, quote unquote, should be able to see it. That is like the cash 22 of today's professional environment. Um, You know, numerous, numerous jobs um, really cultivate this kind of norm and culture of what it is to be a good worker, which does involve kind of an idea that you're at the ready or accessible. Um, and then there's, there's really robust research that shows that this is kind of a new way of, of showing dedication and competency. Um, obviously we have not clear metrics um, mm-hmm. of, of what it means to be good at your job, which is lots of jobs, right? Consultants, um, most knowledge professionals. It's not like you have you know, something that you've built that could either be designed, you know, could break or not break. Um, uh, it's not like you're a salesperson where you have clear numbers and if you've reached your numbers, you can check off that I'm a good worker. So a lot of these ambiguous jobs, these more ambiguous professions, we're trying to figure out how do we actually measure competency and oftentimes dedic- uh, you know, a sec- accessibility becomes proxy for dedication and competency. It's a really thorny issue. Um, and even organizations that understand that this is a problem still have a hard time figuring out what to do about it because they do, you know, because it's become so embedded in our head of how we're at the ready. That's not what you wanted to hear because you were asking exactly, you know, what might we do about that? <laughs> um, what I can say is that there's been some really interesting efforts. I've worked with Leslie Perlow from Harvard Business School about interesting change efforts that often happen at the level of project teams. Um, rather than individuals, um, or even a bigger level, if you can actually do it within a division or even maybe an organization. But you have to think of this as a collective issue, right? So who is it in your life that's expecting that kind of responsiveness? And can you work with those people to develop different norms? It's very tricky, um, but I'd highly recommend Leslie's book. It's called Sleeping With Your Smartphone, but it's really um, unpacking a change effort in a large consulting company where she, and actually I was part of that 
research where we went out and interviewed and understood a, a, and helped facilitate a change effort that was at the project team level where teams had to create different ways of engaging so that individuals could take predictable time off, which actually meant like predictable time away from their email um, in the evenings. And um, I think once you can get actually a collective buy-in and there's some nice strategies in that book about how to do that, then that's going to be the secret towards actually individuals getting more control over their time. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit paradoxical that in order for you as an individual to get control over your time um, outside of working hours, you actually need to collectively work together with your peers and colleagues to do that. Of course, it requires some leadership buy-in and stuff like that. Um, but I, I think that might be the only answer. I don't think any one of us can just choose to put it down when we live in those environments and we want to be respected as part of those, in part of those environments. Yeah, well, I mean, we have this comment here from Carl that I'd want to read. He says, um, my concern that an individual's time in life is becoming less their own. The idea that if I do not read, much less answer right away, an email or a text from someone, that delay means I'm slighting them. It's an increasing demand and expectation that they own part of my time. Um, if one tends to, if one tends first interruptions by computer or phone, then when will one get things done in their job, family, and life? It's a really good question, Carl. I mean, it's one that's, that's occupied me for about 15 years, um, or I said 12 years, about 12 years. Um, you're right. I think that many of us experience this in our, in our everyday life. And again, I think that this is, there's a, there's a fundamental problem where the way we think about smartphones and the way we experience them. So if you look at the kind of the current conversation about smartphones, it's about a user and a tool. And what that mm -hmm. implies to me is you've got a single individual using a tool. And, um, and even when we talk about people who overuse their technology, we use language like addiction, which is again, a language of an individual problem, a pathology. Nowhere or very rarely in the conversation about smartphones do we talk about the fact that these tools are actually just linking us um, to everyone around us. Uh, so I almost imagine it being like, there's a person, you know, this is me, right? And I'm like, there's a million people around me that could be my friends, my colleagues, my babysitters, you know, all the people that help me and I rely on in my everyday life. And if you think about it, like we're all connected by a string. And, you know, in a way, once upon a time, those strings had some slack in them. <laughs> and if somebody wanted my attention, they might like tug at the string and, you know, it would, it would travel. And, and maybe I wouldn't even feel the tug. Like maybe I would say, oh, I didn't get your voicemail. And that was maybe frustrating, but it was a perfectly reasonable thing to not get someone's voicemail message or their answering machine message, you know, back. Or, I mean, I remember when my family first got an answering machine. So before the answering machine, <laughs> just, the call would just ring and ring, right? And, you know, there were frustrations with that way of working and living because we couldn't, we didn't always know where people were, et cetera. Yeah. But now, if you think about it, all those strings are pulled super taut, right? And so if someone tugs, you're like jerked that way. And when, when you're tugging others, it can be a real feeling of empowerment and like stress relief and control over my life. Like I can get, you know, I, I can get this person to go pick up my kid from school like that. I can make, check my email and make sure nothing's blowing up at work. And I'm feel like I'm on top of things like that can be a really, a lovely feeling of agency, but of course they can tug at us just as much. And so we tend, we're a very individualistic society here in the U S I know you guys are all over the world, but we tend to, to really focus on our ability to tug at others <laughs> rather than really step back and conceptualize how much we're all tugging at each other. And I think what you're um, talking about, Carl, is that experience of being tugged in multiple directions by multiple people and that these technologies have facilitated both because of the capacity of the technology and as you've talked about the kind of layering of social expectations that now you have to be at the ready, otherwise, you're either not a good colleague, you don't care about your work, you don't love your spouse, you know, whatever it is, um, that that the social norms plus the capacity of the tools have made us really at the beck of call and feeling tugged all over. Again, the answer to the collectively, I, I don't think one individual can just put it down and actually live the lives that you're probably trying to live. So when you're living in that state, you've got all those strings pulling on you. Um, do you have a sense, you know, what's the emotional cost? What's the psychological cost that, that people pay now for that? Um, so I'm not a psychologist, so I can't actually answer that from a, you know, a, an informed resource perspective, but I can just tell you my gut sense of that. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I find fascinating is when I talk to people about their stress, 
um, I used to think that I was getting really messy signals and really messy data about the effect of this way of living on stress. And then I actually realized that depending on, I was asking them about their experience of checking their email this morning. They would tell me that the phone helped their stress, right? Because of that sense, like they say, those individual kind of micro moments of control where I can be like, I'm looking, okay, no one needs me. <laughs> stress relief for that second. However, if we were kind of talking about big picture careers and life goals, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they would reframe the device as something that was really, really intensifying their stress because of this inability to disconnect and reflect and figure out kind of who do I want to be in this world. Um, so I, I think in some ways that it's this kind of paradoxical effect on our emotional state where it simultaneously allows us to feel like we're able to do and be more and is kind of, you know, kind of taking away from or, um, you know, undermining our ability to actually do and be the people we want to be. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? I think so. Um, it, it's t it's interesting. It gets to another question we have here from an anonymous person, um, and maybe you kind of answer this a little bit. But they want to know, you know, how can you separate the device from the internet when you study these kinds of things? Like, you see, does they want to know? Like, th this person says, isn't a lot of this research work describing radical shifts uh, since the World Wide Web came along um, versus just when devices came out? So I think that's a great question. And actually, um, yes, right? So we're, the internet is facilitating these connections. It's facilitating the, the kind of having information at our fingertips and people at our fingertips to a certain degree. But when those people are actually at our fingertips, meaning like in our pockets <laughs> and carried around with us, I do think it kind of cause an amplification of expectations or a ratcheting of expectations of how much we could and should be available to each other. If if my internet access was really just reserved to my kind of giant screen right here at my office, it would be a very different experience, right? I'd have to physically go to a place mm -hmm. um, to connect. So I think that there is that the very mobility of some of these devices allows us to re, you know, it, it shifts our expectations. Now that can both be freedom, right? I've had many people tell me like, I can leave the office now. Um, and that's very lovely, but that freedom also then means that you're more at the beck and call and not just to work. So, I mean, I remember uh, I talked to one really articulate lawyer who said, you know, my, my child has baseball every Wednesday. And before this thing, I never could have gone, right? And now I go to baseball every Wednesday. I leave work at two and I go, and doesn't that awesome? But what was the experience of baseball? Well, the experience of baseball was him on the sidelines on his device, and in an interesting way is that his family both felt like, you know what, you can be here <laughs> because you have the device and you owe it to us to come to baseball because we love you and we want you to be a good dad, et cetera. Um, but for him, so he felt trapped where like he could physically be there, but not mentally be there. And then he felt like he was simultaneously both not being a good dad and not being a good lawyer. And that's mm -hmm. a really hard space to be in emotionally. But if the expectations of his wife and child were just as strong as his expectations from colleagues and people in the workplace, right? So you're really getting pulled in these directions. The last thing I'll say is I actually, I don't think anybody meant to do this, but I think smartphones are kind of brilliant in their the design of this block because so people think that the next stage of of um you know mobile computing is going to be wearables or even implants you know people who study like under skin technology and it may be but what i think is so fascinating about these particular things is because they they feel like it feels like mine like there's me using it it's my little world but I can actually put it down. And so it allows me to feel like I have control over it, that, you know, that, that, and that you have control over yours and you have control over yours and you should only answer my messages in your downtime. Mm -hmm. And so it, per, it, it kind of perpetuates this feeling of individual control, but, but the, but the actual visceral experience of use is something that's really intimate and can be pocketed and kind of worn on the body. So it's like this interesting kind of, um, hybrid space between it being part of us and not part of us at the same time allows us to keep thinking we're in control in some ways. That just got kind of dark, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, your baseball anecdote, um, 
it really leads into getting a few questions. I know we were talking about this right before we went live is, you know, kids and technology, um, you know, someone wanted to know what advice you had for modeling healthy relationships with technology for your school age children. That is a great question. And I, um, so I have another slightly separate stage of research, uh, stream of research working with parents and teenagers and family dynamics about the role of technology in the family and in their experience of growing up. And um, so you asked that question about modeling. I do think that that's important. And I think, but I almost think that what's more important than modeling is, is communicating and talking about it, right? You do have multiple demands and you know, I think it's okay for kids to see that, you know, parents have different lives and they do, and that we're not going to ignore our children, but we're going to say, you know what, this is what I'm doing right now. And this is why I have to do it. And this is when I'll come back to being engaged with you or something like that. I think just the ignoring is very alienating to children, but children are actually very understanding of the fact that their parents have demanding lives. I mean, so I can, uh, was led a study where we interviewed over a hundred parent teen dyad. So it was 200 all together. And it was so interesting because the teenagers were very understanding of their parents' lives, particularly if their parents were talking to them about it. But what I have found is that oftentimes parents in their, you know, desire to be good parents, obviously, are very, very restrictive of the child's use of technology. And I don't think that that's a problem necessarily, but that restriction can come with like a blanket, no, you're not using it. And the kids don't always understand why, because from a kid's perspective, you know, my, my technology is actually where I'm having very valuable relationships that are often incredibly positive, right? So this kind of storyline that social media causes depression, that may be true for some kids on the margin, but many, there's also research that shows that kids' sense of self, self of confidence, their quality of their relationships is enhanced when they have groups of friends that are engaging in this kind of positive way online. So for them, maybe this is a tool that where I'm living my friendships. Mm. I have kids who say, you know what? My parents say no YouTube, but like, that's where I, that's how I get so that I can do my math homework. <laughs> and don't they want me to do good in math? <laughs> and YouTube again is one of these incredible resources where you do have kids going on and learning create, creative art projects and you know math videos and all kinds of interesting stuff. But of course, there's also very toxic things on YouTube. So this is gonna add one more pressure on parents, but the more that you can actually engage with your child, talk about how social media is not the same. Um, and, and- Melissa, and, sorry, you cut off our last bit. Talk about how oh, social media isn't the same as- So social media is not the same. First of all, every type of social media is not the same and the social media is not the same experience for everyone. So I was speaking with a, a really wonderful mom the other day who has four teenagers and we were talking about Instagram. And she said that, you know, she, she sat down with her daughter and it was really funny because the school went on a trip to Europe and they were looking through her daughter's Instagram account and, and they saw, so one friend had posted all of these interesting architectural highlights of the trip and these kind of very beautiful pictures. And someone else had posted a bunch of selfies of them looking moody on the train. And, and so they talked about like, well, what, it, what is this saying about yourself and what kind of engagement with the world are you having? It's the same tool, it's the same social media feed, but it's a very different way of engaging with the world. And mm -hmm. I think the more that we can actually teach and talk to our children about the experience of, of living our lives somewhat online. Um, you know, I talk to my daughter a lot about what is it to have public versus private accounts? And are these people that I have real relationships with that I'm maintaining and actually feeling very positive about? Or are these a bunch of people that I barely know and going online has, you know, elicits different emotional experiences for me. Um, so I think having these conversations as much as you can, I mean, if you have older kids, it can be trickier if they've already kind of started to do the natural disconnect. And by the way, developmental psychology literature shows that all teenagers disconnect. <laughs> it's actually a very important part of the developmental process. And oftentimes, you know, when we're living in a technologically saturated age, it's particularly scary for parents because what are they disconnecting into? Mm -hmm. um, but we tend to blame the technology for the disconnect when the disconnect is actually a very normal part of growing up. But the role technology is playing might be tricky, right? So, but don't say, oh, my kid wouldn't have disconnected from me if cell phones didn't exist. They would have, or at least they should have. Um, so, 
as soon as you can start having these reflective conversations with your kids about their experience of technology, about what it means to be at other people's beck and call, and how can you avoid that, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. like, do, you, do I've created a reputation that I don't take my phone with me everywhere. So therefore, I mean, I'm not kidding. If colleagues want to get a hold of me, they actually call my husband on the phone. And I'm fine with that. But I'm in a power position where I can do that. But as a kid, you can also kind of frame your engagement to your friends so that you can mm -hmm. start to avoid some of these expectations. And if I don't text you right or back, you know, that means something. Um, there is a woman, Candace Ogders, O-G-D-E-R-S, who's here at UC Irvine. She's a psychologist. She's written quite a lot about the role of smartphones in adolescence and really trying to kind of push back and contextualize and add nuance to the narrative that are ruining a generation, um, which I actually don't agree with. I think that they are something that we need to make sense of and contextualize because they're not going anywhere. <laughs> I really don't think they are. I mean, we might have the next evolution, but we're not going to go back to a day without technology. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's our coming on us to teach our kids how to engage with this rather than kind of operate in a culture of fear in which the teens themselves, the adolescents themselves become deeply afraid of something that is also integral to their daily lives. So I've heard many, many teens be like, I should use it less. I'm an addict. I have a problem with my phone. But they don't really know why and they don't really know what that means. They've just been told that so much that it's a really kind of challenging, ambivalent emotional state to being as an adolescent. And I feel for them. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like a lot of people you're we talking before the call about this, this notion of addiction and people talking about they're feeling too connected. Um, you know, someone here, uh, non, another anonymous question asked her wanted to know, you know, is the industry that produces these devices doing any kind of research on this? Are they changing what they do in response to these kinds of fears that are out and about? Absolutely. I mean, so the last maybe two years in particular, you know, Apple has come out saying we need to do something about technology addiction. Um, I don't think that is bad. I actually think the industry does need to think about the role they're playing. Um, but I also think that maybe I may still hope that it has some nuance, right? So like, let's just as a, like a real simple example. I think it might be interesting for me to see on my phone, not how many minutes I've been on it, but maybe how many minutes I've been on different apps mm -hmm. and maybe uh, uh, some sort of self-reflection exercise to be like, oh, do I feel good about that? <laughs> you know, like, am I glad I spent three hours on, you know, ESPN.com or something? Um, so helping us actually think through our use rather than just say all use is bad. Um, because I actually do see a lot of productive and positive forms of use as long as you personally and with the group of people around you can manage those rising expectations and the kind of the attention sucking grabbing way that these tools do really kind of, you know, draw us in um, with incredible force and stickiness. So um, I do understand the nature of the fears, but I, I want to go beyond just being scared, if that makes sense. Okay. And it just as a, as a side note, so I have to say that we did some research on past reactions to other kind of new forms of, of uh, communication and so forth. And let me tell you, people were so petrified of the effect of the radio on their children. Like the radio <laughs> is going to turn our generation into antisocial, psychotic murders, like literally, as well as comic books. There were real fears about the rise of novels and how it was going to make us people that didn't communicate anymore, didn't talk anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because the novel was going to be more interesting than everyday life. So this idea of this kind of ongoing concern about whatever the media is that is kind of capturing people's attention, it's definitely not new. And again, not unwarranted, but something that we should put in context. Okay. I, I want to go back to the, the workplace stuff for a second. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, Volker um, wanted to know, what managers could do um, to prevent employees from stressing themselves out. And someone noted that, um, I guess at Daimler, they have a policy of deleting employees' emails while they're on vacation and want to know what you think of that. I personally find it horrifying, but. Um, <laughs> um, so I think that, so to, to step back a second, 
I think we have to think about the intersection between technology and email and our norms and ideas about what it means to be a good worker, right? So there's a lot of research done on the kind of myth of the ideology of the ideal worker. And this is this is a kind of worker who's gonna be valorized and promoted and seen as being on top of things. And this is a worker who's working long hours, both at home and in the office. It's someone who's available and at the ready 24 seven. Someone who's willing to up and move their family for a job at the drop of a hat. Like this is the most extreme, right? But there's lots of little ways in which these ideal worker norms and expectations kind of get seeded into our ideas about how we're going to judge other people and how we're going to judge ourselves. Um, and and they're very subtle and they're very. Um, I might remember one company I worked at. They were concerned that people were working very very long hours. So they had a big leaderboard and they put a big letters, everybody who was working over 80 hours a week and then like a red graph of how much they were working. Well, so what did that do? It became a point of pride, right? Because they actually hadn't changed the culture of incredibly long work hours meaning that you were really dedicated. Hmm. So even though this was a, I think probably an honest attempt on management leadership to, 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 you know, change this, it actually became something that was a point of pride. So what I would suggest for anybody in a management role is to actually think about putting your money where your mouth is in terms of how are you modeling behavior? What are you, act, what, how are you spending your time because you are in a power position? Are you spending emails at night? It's pretty easy to send them in the morning and to, and to cash them. I mean, it's really every email client allows you to do it. Um, are you working incredibly long hours? Are you telling people, oh, I can't make that meeting because I'm too busy? Are you lying when you leave work early to go to a kid's sporting event? You know, are you owning that you might have a life outside of work and actually admitting it to your colleagues? <laughs> All these things are a million different signs to those around you and particularly those below you that, oh, you know, maybe I am allowed to admit I have a child of a family or any, I mean, actually, I don't mean to focus just on parents. Maybe it's just that you went to the gym and that's actually something that's really valued and helpful for your, you know, mental and physical health. Maybe mm -hmm. it's that you have a really strong relationship with a church or a religious community. I mean, it can be anything. I, I think sometimes our work family policies end up um, punishing those who don't have families, but they need to have lives too, right? Um, so, what are you doing to actually model this rather than try and institute a policy that actually either won't be used because people realize that if they actually take the flexible time or they take the paternity leave, it's actually going to hurt their career. Research shows that repeatedly. Um, so a policy that is going to be a false policy or, you know, techniques like deleting emails or putting up leaderboards about hours that are going to be these real harsh measures that may or may not actually help people. In terms of the deleted emails, though, I think that's kind of fascinating. <laughs> I have to get over there and see what's going on. Um, I, I, someone else um, wants to talk about getting back to that, that leaderboard, which um, is wild and weird. I mean, someone wants to talk about the, again, we're getting back to this term addictive, which I, I know you have problems with. But is it true that when we get these message notification texting on your phone that it's triggering some kind of shot of endorphin you know is that why you know when you're playing two dots or angry birds on light or something that's what's going on there i mean i think there may be part of it is again i'm not a psychologist i do know that there's research that shows that we do get a little endorphin rushes and that you know we have an entire industry that is based on capturing your intention a very, very wealthy and powerful industry, right? So Facebook runs on ads. <laughs> you know, the idea that we're going to have these kind of holistic, you know, engagement with these devices and the, and the applications they support when the companies that are building those applications are based on ad revenue is a little bit counterintuitive. So mm -hmm. yes, they, they have become extremely good at capturing our attention. I mean, Facebook in particular has a whole team to like, look at the different color of the background of this ad versus that ad and which one's going to get more clicks. I mean, they're very, very nuanced in the way that they're kind of capturing our implicit explicit attention through implicit changes or tiny changes. Um, so yeah, I don't think that that's crazy. I mean, I do understand, but does that mean we're at the mercy of the color of the background of the ad on Facebook? I actually don't think, um, you know, there are lots of things that give us endorphins that we, you know, that we have to figure out how to manage, right? So like food, <laughs> you know, we all have to eat. 
mm-hmm. couldn't tell you to stop eating because you're eating too much ice cream. Um, just like I'm not going to tell you to never look at a cell phone again or do t- detox or you know disconnect um, because you're on Facebook too much or whatever it is. I don't mean to, to demonize Facebook. Facebook can be used just like any other tool, you know, the other app. But um, so so like you resist ice cream, right? At least some of the time, <laughs> just like we can resist these other things. So yes, there may be an endorphin component, but that doesn't mean we are at the mercy. And I think we need to kind of take ownership of that as a collective. Again, I don't think it's mm-hmm. always individual, the individual burden. And part of the reason I don't like the word addiction is not that it may or may not be true, but I think that all the conversation is on individual pathology and individual problems. And I just want to expand the conversation and talk about collective dynamics, because I think that's where we might get real kind of dramatic shifts in how we engage with these tools in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Someone wanted to know about, um, I know you mentioned you've looked at different kinds of fields. I don't know if um, education is one of them. You know, someone wants to know about how test scores change or don't change where these districts where every kid has an iPad, every kid has a laptop. Mm -hmm. Um, Does it seem like, like you say, this is technology is not going away. This is the world as it is now. So kids might as well get started early. Is it helpful? Is it harmful? Is it unknown? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm not someone who's actually studied the educational context that much. As I said, I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in many different businesses. I've worked in people's personal lives, but not uh, education specifically. Um, I do know, I mean, there's some, there's an interesting, actually, there's a new professor in my department named Roderick Crooks, and he studied, he studied one of these no child left behind iPad for all student policies in the LA school districts. And, you know, the findings were that it's how the, it's just a device. (laughs) So it's how it was implemented, how technology, um, how, how classrooms are or are not able to actually integrate it into a true learning experience. If you're putting kids in a corner with iPad, it's not going to change that much. If you're actually able to like integrate that, uh, the capacities of the technology into, you know, again, a real learning experience, it might be fabulous. But if you think about our schools and our teachers, oftentimes are so overburdened with so much stuff that that's a real, that's a real big ask of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Roderick talks about how like the relationship between education and technology is this kind of this roller coaster where we think technology is going to like do all these amazing things and then it doesn't. And then we get really angry and think that technology is ruining children and education. And then the next thing comes along and we think it's going to save us. And then, you know, and it doesn't. So I think, again, it's a much bigger structural problem um, than just throwing iPads at schools mm-hmm. or not even structural problem, but structural, like, you know, dynamic. I mean, there's a lot that would go into an iPad actually dramatically uh, helping the learning environment of a student. And of course, the students in lower socioeconomic areas oftentimes have fewer resources in the family and outside the school to actually engage with that device in a way that's going to actually increase their learning capacity. Mm-hmm. Well, so if we think about like what you've talked about, the idea of moving from the sense of the individual, oh my gosh, I'm failing to adequately respond to all of these things in my life to, okay, this is a bigger system-wide issue as one person living in that system, you know, what kinds of, what do do? Do you, yeah, what do you do? How do you act on that? What's the, what's your kind well, of advice there? <laughs> well, I would say you're, you're, you're not alone, right? Like every single time I talk about this to any group of people, they're like, okay, oh, yeah, that's my life. That's my life. Right. So if there's a lot of people living these lives, I think the first thing you could do is start talking to people. Right. So, I mean, even just, so who think about who are the people that you feel the most Beckett called to, probably because you care about them, either personally or professionally, probably because, you know, their assessment of you matters to you, um, again, both personally and professionally. Is there ways to start having those conversations in multiple arenas of your life to say, hey, just so you know, like it could be with friends, like I adore you. I can't answer your text for three days. It's Can we just put that out there as a blanket understanding or something? Or, um, you know, and then with work, it can be trickier, but actually bringing this up in a team environment and, and, it, and you know, maybe even bringing in the research that shows, you know what, that we work together less effectively when we are all at each other's beck and call. And if we can, is there a way that we can figure out to have more predictability about time and input and when we expect things to come for each other so that both we could each have individual control over our time a little bit outside of work and we can work more effectively as a team. And again, I would go back to Leslie Perlow's book on sleeping with your smartphone because um, that research did find that the teams that really embraced this change effort and were able to kind of 
institute and carve out the predictable time off for everybody in the team work together much better. Um, and they, they had a much better output. It's very hard to implement, um, but it's, but when it's done, it, it really is kind of a win-win for the organization and the team as well as the individuals. So I would start having those conversations um, and know that you, that, that, you know, don't be angry at the world because the world feels the same way you do, right? So if you like start attacking your colleagues because you feel trapped, you have to recognize that they probably feel just as trapped as you do. And so the more that we can kind of have these conversations within groups of people who kind of are doing this to each other without meaning to, I think that's maybe a seed, a seed for change. Okay. <laughs> Let me, um, I, ask, I think we're getting, we're getting low on time here, but we got another question here that I think is a really good one. Um, someone who notes that we're mostly talking about white collar work. Um, oh, that's a, what, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> Yeah, so technology has very different effect on, on not white collar work in the sense that kind of both the idea of what it is to be in the part of the gig economy where you're doing contract work, maybe based on little bits of work. So whether you're driving Uber or Lyft or you're working for Amazon Turk, um, it's a very different experience of your, of your tool. It both allows people to do that kind of work. And in that way, it, it, it could be something that's very, you know, it could be a whole other form of work that potentially could um, maintain the freedom and autonomy of workers and give them flexibility for their schedule while also, you know, providing predictable income. That's not how it's necessarily being implemented right now. Those kinds of workers are being exploited left, right, and center, and oftentimes through something we, we think of as algorithmic management, but the way that the algorithm kind of determines their life in a way that they don't have a lot of control over. If you're a service worker and you're working for a place that is doing optimization of, of employees, you could be told 10 minutes to a half hour before whether or not you're coming into work that day. It's incredibly difficult life to live if you have any responsibilities outside of the workplace, which you probably do. So it's very, very hard for that kind of work. The way So right now, the, tech, the algorithms are designed to optimize effectiveness for the organization, but we really are not bringing in um, anything about the well-being of the workers. And I think it's a, it's a kind of a loaded powder keg that is really, really unfortunate. And I think that both as well as the algorithms underlying Lyft, Uber, Amazon, Trick, et cetera, they could be tweaked to actually bring in worker well-being, predictability of schedules, um, appropriate pay for what you're doing. The algorithms could change. And I, I, I don't know how to make that change in terms of whether or not those companies to start to do that but it is possible. So it's really not the technology's fault. It's how we are implementing the technology in service of some goals over other goals. But I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a really good question. Um, uh, I think I'll do one more, which is going back to just going back to the workplace issue one more time. Um, are there indices that rank companies that are better or worse at a uh, technological, I guess, sucking you in? Um, if you wanted to find a workplace that was uh, better than others or not really? That's a good question. I mean, there's always the like indices of the best companies to work for, companies that have the most policies that are kind of seen as, as worker friendly, such as like paternity leave, maternity leave, you know, flexible time, et cetera. Um, I know that there's some on like best places to work. It's a place to start. I don't think any of those indices are perfect. I mean, mm -hmm. I've actually worked with companies who are on those lists and they spent a lot of time figuring out how to get on the list. <laughs> um, and not that they're totally, um, you know, not that they're being totally two-faced, but it is kind of a, an art form to get on those lists and it may or may not perfectly reflect the internal environment. Mm -hmm. um, again, be wary of policies because policies suggest that someone in charge decided to implement a policy either for reasons being that they actually want the workers to take the advantage of that policy or because they realize it's going to get them on a list. And you need to be thinking about whether or not people actually take advantage of these policies and what happens to those that do. Um, so part of it, 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 we have a ton of, you know, we have the, the kind of websites where people write about their actual experience at work. I'm forgetting the name of the big one, you know, where people- Oh, Glassdoor. Yes, Glassdoor. I think that that can be good data. Be careful that the only people who write are usually people who are unhappy. So take that with a grain of salt. But um, but I do think that, that can be a form of getting data that you can't get elsewhere. Um, I don't think anyone's really measuring the kind of suck in part. But I do think that in a job interview process, you're going to get a sense, right? 
um, if people are not sucked in, it's such a big deal that they will describe it. Mm. Right. So right now we've, we so expect constant visibility. If someone says, Oh, I love working here. I put my phone down at night and I don't pick up till morning. Okay. That's worth commenting on. Um, when you're talking to someone about their job, if they are not saying that you could maybe say, Oh, how often are you <laughs> checking in in the evenings? Because the default is that they are usually. Mm -hmm. um, so I, no, I don't think anyone's measuring it systematically. I think it might be tricky to measure systematically. Um, but I think there are, I mean, I think this conversation is happening in a lot of places. And so um, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll just make the conversation more and more visible. Um, well, Melissa, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I think we have to wrap up, but um, I want to thank you so much um, for sharing your expertise with us today. I think I feel a little bit better about my phone, so maybe other people do too. Um, and I want to thank everyone who tuned in to the Faculty Forum online. Um, I think we hit most of the major questions, but um, alumni office staff are going to be sure to go back through, forward all questions to Melissa that we didn't hit on air. Um, and um, again, if you want to tweet about today's chat, um, we encourage you to use the hashtag MIT Better World. Um, if you have follow up questions or feedback, you can send those to alumni learn at mit.edu. Um, so thanks everyone for watching. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.